Good morning, Confirmands. Glad you can make it, whether it's Sunday morning or later in the week. I'm glad you're joining us um, to hear about today's lesson. We're going to be talking about what happens when we die. So kind of an interesting topic. Um, let me uh, share some announcements and then we'll get started on the lesson. Okay. So don't forget there is Lighthouse. It's starting up. There is Lighthouse tonight, this Sunday, and there will be for the next few Sundays. Remember, there are three places you can go. There's the Lighthouse in Frisco. There's one not far from the church, and then there's one here actually at the church. So try and pick one. Find a couple of friends to bring with you. They don't have to be St. Andrew people, but we would just love, I would love for you guys to try it. And if you go to one and it's not really your, your thing, try a different location because each of them have their own little personalities. And hopefully you'll be able to find one where you feel comfortable, but we would love for you to come and try it for a few weeks and start being a part of this community. It's a great way for you to meet some of our high school um, leaders also. All right. We also are still doing home days on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from two to six. So feel free to come by when you can. We are going to be start tutoring soon. I will let you know when that happens, but just come hang out. Come, you know, we always have snacks. We would just love to see you um, come do your homework, whatever you need to do. We just want to be able to touch base with you um, during the week. So we would love to see you at one of our home days. All right, let me pray real fast and then we'll get started on our lesson. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for these people who are watching. And I just pray that what I say will be clear and make sense. Um, this is a topic that can be difficult. And where and whereas we no, don't have a real clear understanding, you do give us hints in scripture that we can depend on. And they are so comforting and encouraging of what you do for us after we die. So I just pray that your um, words will sift through my mouth, that what I say will be clear um, and make sense. And Father, that people will, um, at the end of this lesson, feel encouraged and comforted by what will happen after we die. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So before we start, a couple of things. One, Everything that I am going to talk about today is rooted in scripture. This is not my, in my what I think is going to happen in heaven after we die. This is not, uh, you know, what uh, different people around the world think. Everything that I'm going to say today is grounded in scripture. And I will try to um, annotate those scriptures um, as often as I can. If you have any questions or any problems, um, especially since you're watching this on the video, please email me or call me and let me know because I'd love to be able to answer it. What I don't want to have happen is at the end of this lesson, you guys feel more confused than you did before. Um, and for those of you, this might be a difficult lesson for some of you because you have just experienced you're grieving a death of someone that you love, um, whether it's recently or not so long ago, starting to think about people who have died or what happens when we might die. That can be um, difficult for some of you. So I, like I said in my prayer, I really hope this is something that will bring comfort and encouragement to you. Um, my intention was not to make you upset, but rather I think this is something that um, everybody needs to hear um, because so much of our faith um, rests on what happens when we die, what's going to happen after. So um, hopefully y'all will get something out of this. All right. As we start, I want us to think of our ourselves, our, our beings as made up of two different things. One is our physical self, which is our body. And the other is our spiritual self, which I'm going to call our soul. Now, I know this might be a little bit confusing. Arthur's in the middle of his solid soul sermon series at church. And when he talks about a soul, he talks about our entire being, including our bodies and our personalities and our experiences. And for his purposes, that is makes sense. But for this lesson, I want you guys to think of yourselves, your, you know, who you are as made up of two parts, your physical body, and then your spiritual soul. It'll just make the lesson a little bit more um, understandable. So when we die, the physical part of us, our bodies are separated from the spiritual part of us. Our bodies cease to live while our souls continue to exist. In um, Ecclesiastes, it says the dust returns to the ground from which it came and the spirit returns to God who gave it. If you guys remember when we talked way back about creation and we talked about Adam and Eve, 
Adam created or God made Adam from the dust of the earth and he breathed life into him. And so later after Adam and Eve sin in the garden, one of their punishments is that they will die. And, and God says to them, from dust you came and from dust you shall return. And so it's this idea that we are created, but our bodies were never made to be eternal, to last forever. It, you know, you can die of disease or in an accident or something like that, but eventually they're just going to wear out. So if you, you know, if you know people, grandparents or people that you know that are you know, in their 90s or 100s, eventually they just die because our bodies were not meant to last forever. And when that happens, our body and our souls are separated. Our souls continue to exist while our bodies don't. All right, if you are a believer, if you believe in Jesus, your soul goes to a place that is good and safe and a place where Jesus is. It is not heaven the way we think of heaven. It's not the permanent heaven, but it is a place where you we go and it is good. It is a good place um, and Jesus is there. So in Luke, when Jesus is on the cross with the two thieves next to him, one of the thieves rejects him, but the other one comes to believe him to be the Messiah. And Jesus says to him, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. And that word paradise comes from a Greek word. And that word means a place of bliss and rest in between life and resurrection or in between death and resurrection. So this idea of paradise, this place that we go, um, I refer to it as paradise. Some other people refer to it as the third heaven or the intermediate heaven, or the present heaven, but because it's not true heaven, I like to just refer to it as paradise, and other people refer to it as well. One caveat, in the Catholic tradition, the Catholics believe in a place called purgatory, where you go and you're sort of making up for your, your pain for some of your sins and some of the things you've done in your lifetime. And you stay in purgatory until you have earned the right to move on to heaven. This is not what I am talking about. There is no scriptural support for the idea of purgatory, um, a place where you go and there is some suffering or it's a, it's a waiting station until you get to heaven. That's not what I'm talking about. The paradise, paradise that I am talking about is a place where you go and there is, it's, there's no punishment there. It's, it's good. Everything there is good. And Jesus is there. We hear about this word again in second Corinthians. Um, it says, therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. And we are confident, I say, and would pre prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. That verse at the end where it says at home with the Lord is the same word that's used for paradise. So it's this idea, this is Paul talking, and he's basically saying, I would rather be with God than in this body, because I know if I'm not in this body, I will be with God, I will be with Jesus. Um, and that but term, like I said, is paradise, that you will go after you die, you immediately will be in the presence of Jesus. And that is always a good thing. All right. So I love the far side and there are quite a few heaven cartoons. So I just threw this in here. Poor Ernest is sent to hog heaven instead of regular heaven. I don't know if that would be good or bad, but I just thought this was funny. All right. So after we die, we are going to go to this place called paradise, but it's not the heaven that we think of. Scripture tells us over and over, and Jesus told his disciples and his followers over and over that he will return to the earth someday. A lot of people refer to it as the second coming of Jesus or the second coming of Christ. In John, Jesus says to his disciples, there's more than enough room in my father's house, father's home. If this were not so, would I have not told you that I'm going to a to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. That's one of the references to Jesus coming back and taking his believers, his flock back to heaven. 
And then in first Thessalonians, it's something similar for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up in the air it caught caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So there is a lot of um, ideas about what it will look like when Jesus comes again. If you take this first Thessalonians verse, um, literally those who are dead will rise first, their bodies will rise um, and meet Jesus in the air. And then if you are alive at that time, your body will go up too. I don't know if we're actually going to like rise up into the air. The scripture says it, there's no reason to think that it wouldn't be that, but it could be possible too, that this is just an allegory saying that those who are dead will, will meet with Jesus first. And then those who are alive will come next. Um, but what I want you guys to focus on is this idea that Jesus is going to be coming back and sort of collecting up his, his people, his flock from the beginning of time until the current day, um, to take them to be with him forever. So if there is a lot of us in paradise, perhaps those are the ones where he says, those who are dead in Christ will rise first, that he will go to paradise first to take those who have already died and then come back for those who um, are alive. When Jesus comes again, he will create the new heaven and the new earth. And these, this heaven and this earth will be permanent and eternal. So we talk about um, our world and we think of it as always being here, but scripture tells us that when Jesus comes again, he's going to create everything new again. And that includes our earth. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know that I can trust that it, however it's going to happen, it's going to be awesome. And in Revelation, where we get a, it's John, the disciple John at the near the end of his life is stuck on an island off of Greece, and he has this vision. And that vision is what mostly the book of Revelation um, contains is he wrote down what his vision was of what will happen um, at the end of time or the beginning of time, depending on how you look at it. And one of the things that he writes is then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. First, the first heaven and the first earth have passed away and there was no longer any sea. That word sea actually doesn't mean like an ocean or the water. That sea actually um, refers back to a word that means chaos. So basically what he's saying is that when the new earth and the new heaven come about, there will be no more chaos. Everything will be exactly the way it is supposed to be. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And then after that, there's this huge long passage just describing the new Jerusalem, what this new city will look like. But what I want you guys to appreciate is this new heaven and this new earth will come and will be eternal. They, it, it won't be like our earth that is constantly changing and moving um, and you know not quite settled. The new earth and the new heaven will be perfect. And we will have new bodies that can live in this new heaven and the, this new earth. So we will be eternal as well. So what will it be like in this new heaven? I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and there be their God. There will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain for the old order of things have passed away. This idea that when we get to heaven, there is nothing bad. There is no sin there. Remember, we accept Jesus and God sees us as being blameless. And when we get to heaven, we will be blameless. We will have no sin. We won't have temptation. We won't have um, the need to sin or the desire to sin. All of that is a way. And if you just take a few minutes to think about what that will be like, where everybody is happy and fulfilled and at peace, there's no arguing, there's no 
dissension. There's no ugliness. Nobody says anything that they don't mean because everybody is just um, in a place where they feel totally the way they are supposed to be. And that's the way it will be when we get to this new heaven, the new heaven and the new earth. All right. When Christ comes again, believers will receive their resurrected bodies. And in these resurrect, these resurrected bodies, as I said earlier, the bodies we have right now are bodies that um, wear out. These are bodies that eventually we're just going to die. That's just, they're not made to last forever. But in our resurrected bodies, they will be made to live forever. And they will be made to be perfect in this new heaven and this new earth. So what are those new bodies going to look like? we will be able to eat. And we know this because when Jesus was resurrected and came back and saw his disciples before he went up to be with God, um, uh, before his ascension, he met with his disciples on the beach and ate with them. In his resurrected body, Jesus ate. So that means that our, we will be able to eat in our resurrected bodies. And when you think about it, we should be able to eat whatever we want and not get fat or not have it hurt our hearts or be bad for our bodies because our bodies will be made to live forever. So how cool is that? We'll be able to eat whatever we want um, and we it won't harm our bodies. I love that idea. We'll be able to walk and talk just like Jesus did to his disciples when he returned, he had conversations with them. We breathed, obviously, um, and we will have these bodies that are created for eternities. And the bodies will be bodies. They are not this sort of urethral. It won't be like ghosts or vapors or anything like that. Remember when Jesus came back and Thomas was so frustrated because he said, I'm not going to believe he returned until I can see him for myself. And Jesus put out his hand and said, feel the holes in my hand. And, and, and so he was somebody... He, his body was something that was able to be touched. It wasn't like this ghost thing. It was a solid thing. And that's what our resurrected bodies will be like as well. And um, from Philippians, it says he will take our weak mortal bodies, the bodies we have right now, and change them into glorious bodies like his own. And they will be made to never get sick, to never be harmed, to never have anything bad um, happen to them because they will be our resurrected bodies. All right. So when you think about heaven, one of the things I want you guys to concentrate on is to remember that it's going to be very much the same, but even better. All the bad things are gone. All the ugliness is gone. All the dissension is gone. And it's just good things. We will still be our unique selves. We will have memories of this life. So if you have had grandparents or people that you know or love die, when you die and see them again, they're going to know you. You're going to know them. You're going to remember times that you had here on earth. We will have memories of this life because that's what makes us who we are. I am unique because of my unique physical appearance and my personality and all of that, but also my memories um, and, and the things that have happened to me in my life. And I will always remember those even after I die. We will recognize people and they will recognize us. I'll be able to go and see my grandmother and my grandparents who have passed away and they will know who I am and I will know who they are and we'll have this lovely reunion. I just love that idea. And that's why as Christians, when we have to say goodbye to somebody because they've died, we have this hope that we're going to be able to see them again and hug them again, literally hug them again and um, talk with them and remember and laugh with them. Um, and all of that is because of what Jesus has done for us. God made each of us unique because he needs each of us in his kingdom right now. Our uniqueness that he made will continue for eternity. We will be made perfect. All of my flaws, all the things that I tend to do wrong, all my pension for sinning, when I get to heaven, that will be gone. So it won't just be me, but it will be the best me that can be. All the things that cause me anxiety or depression or things I don't like about myself, 
all of that will be gone because I will be fully who God created me to be in his presence and in the presence of everybody else who is who they are, who they were completely made to be. And I don't know, for me, when I think about it, it's almost hard for my mind to grasp just how wonderful and um, I, just what a joy that is going to be. So just to recap a little, remember that death rips us into the body and soul, but resurrection puts us back together again, not with our old body, but with our new body. That's the beauty of the resurrection is that we are made whole, but not even whole, but better. It's sort of like Holly 2.0. I'll just be so much better. Um, I'll be exactly who I have always meant to be. All right. So we are going to talk about what happens if you are not a believer. So again, a little far side cartoon, just for a little bit of humor. So if you are not a believer, your soul, scripture says your soul goes to a different place. In the Old Testament, this place is referred to as Sheol, which is a Hebrew word. And Isaiah, um, it says, the dead cannot praise you. They cannot raise their voices in praise. Those who go down to the grave can no longer hope in your faithfulness. It is this idea that remember that your soul lives on after you die. So you can, your soul can go to paradise and then eventually heaven. Um, if you are a believer, and if you're not, your soul's going to go someplace where God is not. He's going to be, you're, you're going to be someplace where you have no access um, to God. It is not, it, it, other places in scripture talk about it, you know, the gnashing of teeth and fire, which is why we get those images like that cartoon. But mainly what I want you to understand is you're going to a place where God is not. In the New Testament, this place is referred to as Hades, which is a Greek word. And in Luke, um, there's a story about a rich man and then a beggar named Lazarus. And it says the rich man died and was buried and he went to the place of the dead, meaning Sheol or Hades. And there in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. So it's this idea that um, if you are not a believer, you are going to go to a place where it is unpleasant torment's a pretty strong word. Um, and people who um, believe will be in a place that is not there, which is in a place that is much better. And like I said, wherever this is, whether you refer to it as Sheol or Hades, it is a place where God is not. For the second Thessalonians says they will be punished with eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord and his glorious power. I think sometimes there's, um, a little saying that talks about, you know, when I go to hell, uh, all my friends will be there. This idea that all the people who are not believers will be down there and having this heathenistic party and you'll be able to do whatever you want because you can sin and do everything that you want down there. But that's not a scriptural um, representation of what happens in hell or in Hades or in Sheol, all sort of that same place. Basically, you're going to a place of torment and destruction, a place where God is not, um, and you are totally separated from God. In my mind, and uh, this is one of the few times where this is just how I view it, I think of it as the Dementors in Harry Potter, where all the joy and life and goodness is sucked away and you're left with all of the sadness and, and woe and you know anything that's bad is in this place um, because all the good has been removed from it. And so here's my last far side. I don't know if you're an accordion player, I hope you're not offended that that's what they, <laughs> they think that they play in hell, but I just think it's, it's kind of funny. So after the second coming of Christ, when he comes, um, if once you, um, if for the people who are still on earth, there is this, this judgment, the white throne of judgment. Those whose names are in the book of life will be with God in the new heaven. Those people also, if you have already died, have been the ones who are in paradise. Those names who are not in the book of life will be extinguished or live in eternity separated from God. Scripturally, there is some, um, um, it's not entirely clear, 
Um, it talks about going to Sheol, where it's this place of torment and a place where God is not. But in Revelation, again, in this vision that John has, um, he describes the white throne of judgment and what happens. Then I saw the great white throne and him who was seated on it. Um, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done it recorded in the books. If anyone's name was not found in the book of life, meaning you weren't a believer, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So it could be that as paradise is this place until the new heaven and the new earth are made, and that's where believers go that the unbelievers or people who have rejected God throughout their life go to Sheol or Hades. And, but once Jesus comes, instead of going to the permanent, um, the new heaven and the new earth, they are thrown into this lake of fire and just they're gone. That's the end of their life. There are other um, versions or other scripture that suggests that they, that those people actually live in torment for eternity. I'm not sure which one it is, neither of them sound like a choice I want to make. So if you reject God and completely reject God all your life, most likely that is going to be where you end up. Now I will say, Arthur has said time and time again that we will be surprised at who is in heaven. God is the only one who can look into our hearts and know what we really feel and what we believe. And God is the one who makes that judgment. So just because we see somebody and we think they don't deserve to be in heaven, or we think, oh, they're going to hell for sure. It could be that later in their life, they come to meet Jesus and have, and, and something good happens and they turn, they repent and they become this, this person who will be in heaven. That's really not for us to judge. God is the judge in where everybody goes. You are merely responsible for yourself and what decisions that you make about um, how you live out your life and therefore where you're going to end up. All right, so again, I just wanna recap. Heaven is this place that is so good. I don't even think we can really imagine how great it's going to be. Hell is going to be very, um, is gonna be a place where you don't want to be. And the deciding factor is who Jesus is to you, what you do with Jesus. If you accept him and say, I believe in him and I believe that he was God's son, that he died, that he was resurrected himself, um, then you will be in paradise with him and eventually in heaven with him forever. That his resurrection will allow you to be resurrected as well. If you completely dismiss God, reject him, say, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't believe that. I think that's all a bunch of, you know, baloney or whatever. Then there's a possibility you're going to end up in a place that's very um, unpleasant for a very long time. Um, so here are the discussion questions. Um, have a discussion with somebody about what you thought it was like, what happened after you, we died. Um, before you heard this lesson and kind of compare it to what you've heard here today. Did you hear anything here that was new? Was there something encouraging, discouraging, confusing? It's okay if it's confusing. Um, it's, not, it's not a clear cut thing necessarily. There's a lot of nuance in it. Have you heard anything today that changes your feelings about God? And how would you describe heaven or hell to somebody else? And then if you have time, I would love for you to get your Bible out and read this big section of Revelation. It describes the new Jerusalem, this new city that will be part of the new heaven and the new earth. And it's just overwhelming. It gives a physical description of it. I would especially encourage you to read it in the New Living Translation. Um, but it's just incredible what it's going to look like. And that is just going to be a piece of the new earth that we have. So thank you guys for listening. I hope this has caused you to think about some things. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, reach out to your parents, talk to them about it. Um, this is not necessarily a topic we talk about a lot, but I think it's really, really important. So I hope you all have a great week. I look forward to um, next week. The next two weeks, we are going to be talking about grace, which is a huge, huge topic. So I hope you guys will watch then too. Until then, have a great week. I love you guys. Bye.